Good morning, Hope Community Church. Uh, hope you can see me. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm smiling this morning. I trust you're smiling back at me. As we enter into worship, I want to read Psalm 100 for us. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray. Father, in our homes, we come today to worship you, to sing to your great name to give thanks to the God who is faithful, whose love endures forever. So God, I pray you'd lead us now to praise you as we sing these songs. It would be all for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So give us a moment. We're going to transition the video to Morgan, and we'll sing a couple songs. Church. For those of you who don't know, um, Jared has a bulletin in her email where all of our songs are at. Thank you. 
worship you and proclaim that um, you are worthy, worthy, worthy. Father, we just thank you for this time that we can worship you in our homes, um, but as a community. We give this time to you in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, so Dennis and Susan Zimmer are going to lead the next part of our service, our scripture reading and prayer time. So give us a moment. We're going to turn the video over to them. Maybe I might change the time. I got the wrong season. Hey, Dennis and Susan, you are on, so you can go ahead. We can hear you. I'm reading um, Philippians 4, 4 through 9. I'm reading from the NIV. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious for, about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice 
and the peace of God will be with you. And earth, you keep your covenants, you show unfailing love to all who walk in wholehearted devotion. Lord, you are my strength. Lord, you are our rock, our fortress, and our savior. The owner that saves, the power that saves me in my place of safety. Lord, we call on you who is worthy of praise and you saved me from our enemies. O oh Lord, our God, you have performed many wonders. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all the wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. Lord, you say to me, to us, don't be afraid. I, we are here to help you. Your word tells us we are here to help you. Lord, truly, this is an amazing grace. And when we think of all the things that you've done here in Hope Church, your word tells us don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then we will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in you, Christ Jesus. We are in our thoughts. We are to the, you know, fix our thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right and pure, and lovely, and be sure that faith, our faith is on you alone. And you will help us. Thank you, Lord, for providing us, including these directions on how to live your life. Lord, we ask you to heal and protect Clara Stones. Lord, we just plead with you to do that. For Philip and Amanda, Lord, we just pray that for God's provision for them as a family and for anyone else that is in needs financially or any other way that you would provide. Lord, for Susan Scallon, we ask for your healing and your recovery from stroke. For Lou Marina, that you would heal her broken foot. For Pete, as far as uh, Pete, that he would com be comforted and that you would give him grace. And as uh, we just pray that uh, you would be close to him, that he would sense your very presence. God, we, our heart goes out to him. We pray for Bill Sutton for God's healing, your healing of his shoulder. And for Joe Higgins' mother, we pray for your healing and discernment, their discernment for physical uh, issues. Greg Stewart, Donna's friend, we just pray for healing of cancer for him. And we know you can do it. We've seen you do it before. And God, we just ask you to do that, just to enter interrupt this uh, illness that he's got with the uh, uh, cancer, and we just pray that you heal him from that. For Craig Fricky, Mary's brother, Lord, just as he's facing a kidney transplant, thank you. I think they found a donor. We thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray for, uh, for that whole situation that you would undertake for them help it to be a success. Pray for Lydia, Morgan's friend. We just pray that for your healing of her tumor. Lord, 
we just really do pray for all the first responders. We pray for your protection and strength. God, as they face the disease or the um, just the issues they may may face, fire or maybe another guy with a uh, gun pointed at him. God, we just pray for your protection from all these things for and any other thing from these for these first reform. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would go before them and provide them with your protection. You tell us you never leave us nor forsake you. And we pray that for all of us, but especially for the first responders. God, just go before them and protect them. And Lord, provide all that we need for a hope. And we just thank you most of all for all that you've done for us and all the things that uh, illnesses that you've cured, all the ways that you've gone before us. We thank you. We just thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Dennis and Susan. Uh, we had a little bit of technical glitches. This is a time where we just need to give each other a lot of grace. We're trying to figure out this technology. So thank you for being patient and gracious with us. Uh, thank you, uh, Dennis, for leading us in that prayer, just praying for the needs of our congregation. Uh, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 37 uh, this morning. So I want to give you a moment uh, to turn to that, uh, Jeremiah 37. And I want to just lead us in another prayer as we open uh, God's word together. Uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you that we can gather in this way, uh, even though it's different. Uh, we're all adjusting to this. Uh, but thank you, God, that we can open up your word each Sunday. And to know, God, how much we need your truth in our lives. Especially in these uncertain times, we need to be reminded what is true about who you are and who we are because we are your people. And so this morning, God, we ask again, speak, Lord. Help us to be your servants, your people who are listening to you, God. And I pray, God, that I would just be in full dependence upon you right now, that you would empower me by your Holy Spirit and would use me, God. Uh, so help us to have ears to hear and hearts to receive what you want to say to us this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I watched a documentary recently that I absolutely loved, and it's surprising I loved it so much because it's about rock climbing. And uh, I have a tremendous fear of heights. And uh, so I'm surprised I loved it so much. The documentary is called Free Solo, and it's about this rock climber named Alex Honnold. And Alex isn't any ordinary rock climber. He's a free solo climber. And what that means is he climbs vertical rocks without any harnesses or ropes. So this is stuff like you don't try at home for sure. And the documentary is about him preparing to climb El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. And if you're not familiar with El Cap, as they call it, it's 3,000 feet of granite rock. And so he's preparing to climb uh, this amazing rock without any ropes, without any harnesses. So this is a life and death climb. And he spends months preparing for it, kind of mapping out the route that he's going to take. And then one morning, June 2017, he goes for it all by himself. No ropes, uh, no harnesses. If he makes one bad move, uh, game over. Uh, his life is ended. And since I made a documentary, of course, he survived and he made it up El Cap, uh, being the first ever in recorded history to do it free solo. He put his life on the line that day. In the book of Jeremiah, chapters 37 and 38, we're going to see that Jeremiah's life is on the line. Uh, not by his own choice. He's facing hostility from other people. 
And I want to give a broad overview of these two chapters and then kind of zero in on something I think is really important for us to hear from God, especially in the season that we're in right now. So we're going to start out in Jeremiah chapter 37, uh, verses 1 and 2. So Zedekiah, son of Josiah, was made king of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He reigned in place of Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim. Neither he nor his attendants from the people of the land paid any attention to the words the Lord had spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. So, so most of God's people are brought into exile in Babylon, but some of the people remain in Jerusalem. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, places someone in charge to be kind of a puppet for him to maintain order in Israel. So Nebuchadnezzar chooses Zedekiah to be his puppet king. And it says in verse 2 that neither Zedekiah nor the people of the land who remain listened to what God was saying through Jeremiah. So Jeremiah's in Jerusalem. He's left after the exile. And he continues to be God's spokesman to the people. That hasn't changed. And unfortunately, nothing has changed with the people. The people still aren't listening to God. So the point here is that Jeremiah continues to serve the Lord despite the apathy of the people. He is faithful, even though there didn't seem to be much fruit. And it's a reminder to us that serving God is often an act of faith. It's entrusting oneself to God, even if the outcomes and the results aren't there. And what we're going to see next is the people's apathy turns to hostility. And Jeremiah is going to find himself in danger. His life is on the line. We're going to jump down to Jeremiah 37, verses 11 through 16. So after the Babylonian army had withdrawn from Jerusalem because of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah started to leave the city to go to the territory of Benjamin to get his share of the property among the people there. When he reached the Benjamin gate, the captain of the guard, whose name was Erijah, son of Shalmiah, the son of Hananiah, arrested him and said, you are deserting to the Babylonians. That's not true, Jeremiah said. I am not deserting to the Babylonians. But Erijah would not listen to him. Instead, he arrested Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. They were angry with Jeremiah and had him beaten and imprisoned in the house of Jonathan, the secretary, which they had made into a prison. Jeremiah was put into a vaulted cell in a dungeon where he remained a long time. So the opposition against Jeremiah, it's, it's personal. Uh, an enemy arises from one of the guards named Erijah. Jeremiah's running an errand. He needs to leave town. And Erijah falsely accuses him of defecting to the Babylonians. And, and Jeremiah's beaten. He's put in, into a dungeon where he remains for a long time. We don't know how long he was there. And this ain't right. This is an act of injustice against Jeremiah. And I don't know about you, but if I'm falsely accused or treated with even a hint of injustice, it doesn't sit well with me. It riles me up. And so we don't know how, how Jeremiah processed this. All we know is he remained in the dungeon for a long time, falsely accused, unjustly prisoned. And Jeremiah is eventually released from the dungeon, and you might think he might reconsider his life plans. Following God just keeps getting Jeremiah into trouble. Does Jeremiah really want to keep doing this? Keep putting his life on the line for God. But Jeremiah doesn't flinch. He doesn't waver. He knows that his life belongs to God, and that he needs to follow God no matter what. So Jeremiah perseveres. He doesn't stop speaking for God, even though his life is in jeopardy. So in the next chapter, we're going to see almost like deja vu. Jeremiah is in trouble as he continues to speak for God. So we're going to jump to Jeremiah chapter 38, starting in verse 1. There's a lot of tricky names here. And I almost want to ask Yvonne to come up and, and read this for me. She's a way better reader than I am, but I'm going to do my best here. Okay, Jeremiah 38, uh, verse 1. Shephatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Peshur, Jehuchel, son of Shalemiah, 
and Pashur son of Melchijah heard what Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, this is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. They will escape with their lives. They will live. And this is what the Lord says. This city will certainly be given into the hands of the army of the king of Babylon, who will capture it. Then the officials said to the king, this man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who are left in this city, as well as all the people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin. He is in your hands, King Zedekiah answered. The king can do nothing to oppose you. They took Jeremiah and put him into the cistern of Melchizedek, the king's son, which was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by the ropes into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud. So Jeremiah keeps warning the people that the exile, even though this is judgment, is God's plan. And if the people want to live, they need to embrace the exile. But the people didn't like the bad news that Jeremiah kept giving them. They were nationalists. They were loyalists to Israel. They put the preservation of their land and their nation over listening to God. And the people weren't going to sit around and just let Jeremiah keep giving this news of doom and gloom. So they capture him again. And they put him away. And this time they lower him into a cistern that had no water, just mud. So Jeremiah is stuck in the mud, literally. Have you ever been stuck in the mud, metaphorically, in your life? Have you ever had circumstances in your life where you felt like, man, there is no way out of this on your own? And maybe this morning in this season of quarantine, you are feeling stuck in the mud. And you're wondering, when will the relief, when will the release come? And for Jeremiah, there was no way out of the cistern on his own. He needs help. He needs outside rescue. And this rescue is going to come from an unlikely source. Let's read on Jeremiah 38, verses 7 through 13. But Ebed-Melech, a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. While the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Ebed-Melech went out of the palace and said to him, My lord, the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech the Cushite, Take thirty men from here with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some old rags and worn out clothes from there and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Ebek Melek the Cushite said to Jeremiah, put these old rags and worn out clothes, cloths under your arms to pad the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. And they pulled them up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. So Ebek Melek is a foreigner. He is a Cushite from the land of Ethiopia. And being a foreigner, Ebek Melek had no legal rights. So for him to approach the king, he was putting his own life in jeopardy. But Ebek Melek sees the need. He knows that Jeremiah is going to die if no one helps him. And God prompts Ebek Melek to do something. And he goes to the king and he advocates for Jeremiah. And the king listens. And Ebek Melech springs into action. He takes 30 men. That's how many men it took to get Jeremiah out of the cistern. And some rags and cloths to make a rope. And out of nowhere, God raises up a friend for Jeremiah. A foreigner who can't help but get involved. Who's part of God's rescue operation to get Jeremiah out of the pit. So as I've been reflecting on this, I couldn't help but think think of a song related to all this. And uh, this song kind of describes the season that we're in as a family. It's from the movie Toy Story. It's called You Got a Friend in Me. So I don't know if you're familiar with Toy Story or not. So just for fun, let's uh, imagine Jeremiah's in this pit. 
And, and Abed Melech is leading the charge. So he's at the, the front of the rope. And he's pulling Jeremiah up. And he's singing this song to Jeremiah. You've got a friend in me. When the road looks rough ahead and you're miles and miles from your nice warm bed, you just remember what your old pal said. Boy, you've got a friend in me. Yeah, you've got a friend in me. If you've got troubles, I got them too. There isn't anything I would do for you. We stick together and can see it through because you've got a friend in me. And it's throughout the book of Jeremiah. So often we see Jeremiah by himself. He's all alone. He's solo. He's doing God's work by himself. And in this passage, we see how God uses a friend to rescue Jeremiah. Jeremiah has a friend in Ebek Melech. And this is a reminder to us this morning, kind of the main point I want to hit on, that this life of following God is not meant to be done solo. We need other people on this journey. Eugene Peterson writes, Jeremiah was never popular. He was never surrounded with applause, but he was not friendless. In fact, Jeremiah was extremely fortunate in his friends. And Peterson goes on to quote Henry Adams, one friend in a lifetime is much. Two are many. Three are hardly possible. Jeremiah was not friendless. And sometimes all you need is one friend. All you need is one person. One person who's going to be there for you. One person who's going to pick you up when you're down. One person who's going to pray for you. One person who's going to have your back. One person who's going to remind you that God is in control. One person who's going to tell you, you are not alone. One person who's going to declare to you that God loves you with an unfailing love. Sometimes all you need is one person. Church, we are not meant to go solo. And I'm going to go back to the Star Wars vault this morning because there's a character in Star Wars with Solo in his name, Han Solo. A few years ago, the movie Solo was released and we were given the backstory of this character, Han Solo. So he grew up on the planet Corellia and he was trying to get off the planet with his girlfriend. Uh, but they got separated and Han is escaping on his own. And the only way he can get off this planet is he has to enlist in the Imperial Navy. And so he's talking to the attendant and the attendant's asking him his name. He says, my name's Han. And the attendant pressed him for his family name. He's just like, my name's just Han. And the attendant gives him the name Han Solo. Han, all alone, Solo. But eventually, Han would meet a Wookiee named Chewbacca. And this character, Chewbacca, would become Han Solo's partner in crime, his lifelong friend, his sidekick. Even Han Solo learned that life is not meant to be done alone. So church, I want to encourage us this morning. God has not called us to live solo. He's called us to live in friendship and community and to recognize we need other people in this life. We are not meant to do life alone. You go all, all the way back to the beginning in the creation story in Genesis. And Adam is all alone. Adam is solo. He is the only human being on planet Earth. And what does God say about this? Genesis 2, 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. God declares it's not good for people to live solo. And this isn't just about marriage. This is about relationship. It's not good for people to do life on their own. We need one another. Eugene Peterson writes again, No one who is whole is self-sufficient. The whole life, the complete life, cannot be lived with haughty independence. Our goal cannot be to not need anyone. One of the evidence of Jeremiah's wholeness was his capacity to receive friendship, to let others help him, to be accessible to mercy. It is easier to extend friendship to others 
than to receive it ourselves. In giving friendship, we share strength, but in receiving it, we show weakness. Our goal cannot be to not need anyone. And one of the challenges of, in living in this country is we celebrate independence. We celebrate self-sufficiency. It's one of the prides of our great nation, the dream that one can make it on their own. But self-sufficiency is not God's dream for us. I'm going to say that again. Self-sufficiency is not God's dream for us. God's dream is for us to live in dependence. It's okay to need other people because God has designed us to need one another. And I believe one of the lessons that we need to learn again in this pandemic is that life is not meant to be lived solo. Even though we're separate and isolated, we need to stick together. We need to be there for one another more now than ever. We need to depend on each other. And we have all the resources with technology to still stay connected in this season of quarantine. And Peterson makes an important point here. For most of us, it's easier to give than to receive. Most of us find it easier to offer help to another person than to receive help from someone else. The challenge for us is learning to put ourselves in a posture of dependence, to acknowledge our neediness before one another. So I want to give us a couple practical encouragements to help us to not live solo and to practice dependence. First, we need to name our self-sufficiency. And I'll go first. I'll be the first to admit too often I'm self-sufficient. Too often I try to do life on my own. And I need to name this. And I believe when we name this, we're inviting God to work in us in this struggle. And at the core of the gospel message is that our self-sufficiency has caused all sorts of trouble for us. It's our self-focus, our self-worship that has alienated us from God. We recognize in our sin, we are in need. We need God's saving help. Self-sufficiency does us no good. And part of the gospel is that God has invited us now into a spiritual family to find belonging and relationship and intimacy. So we are called to not be self-sufficient relationally. And through relationship with others in the body of believers, we can experience more of God, more of the life that he wants for us. So we need to name our self-sufficiency. Second, we need to embrace our neediness before others. For Jeremiah, it was obvious. He was stuck in the mud, in a cistern. He knew that he was in need. And maybe part of our problem is it's not obvious enough that we need others. Not obvious, obvious how relationally needy we are. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul uses the metaphor of a human body to describe our relationships with one another in the body of Christ. And I want to read this. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 21 through 27. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. The parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, or presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. So I want you to imagine this morning that we are worshiping together in Keller junior high. So think about where you normally sit uh, in the cafeteria that we meet in on Sundays. And just in your mind, scan the room. And think about the people in our congregation. I think about the ladies that sit in the front row. I think about our, our praise team. 
I think about our AV team, our, our elders. I think about the people that make coffee for us in the morning and just our entire congregation. And it says here, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Now you are the body of Christ and each of you is a part of it. Do we realize the significance of what this is saying? I can't say to any member of our spiritual family that I don't need them. I need every single person in our body of believers. You need every single person in our body of believers. All the parts of the body. There's a neediness for one another in the body of Christ. And I believe we need to be more intentional in acknowledging our neediness and inviting others into it. So I want to get really practical this week. I want to encourage you. We've been challenging people to, to reach out to one another. Stay connected. I want, to, I want to flip it a little bit this week. I want you to still reach out to, to someone, but I want, I want you to reach out in a position of need a posture of dependence. And what this could look like is you contact someone in our church family and you tell them how they can support you this week. You describe to them how they can encourage you or love you despite the quarantine. You share with them how they can pray for you. You, you reach out and you put yourself in a place of need, a posture of dependence. I, I wanna challenge us this week, reach out. And don't just check in on the other person. And invite yourself to be needy before them. So as I close, for my whole life, I've had the privilege on Sunday mornings to gather with my spiritual family. And I realize how much I have taken this for granted. And I think part of the lesson that God is giving us in this season of quarantine is reminding us of the priorities and reminding us how much we have taken for granted. To be able to gather on Sundays is a gift. So when we're ba back together on Sundays, which I can't wait for that day, let's appreciate it. When we're able to be together on Sundays again, let's thank God that we can gather once again as a spiritual family. But until then, we need to figure out in this season how to stick together, how to not live solo. And it's going to require us for, to, for us to embrace new things and new ways of staying connected. And I want to remind us, we have not been called to God as individuals, just you and God. We've been called into a people, God's people. We are the body of Christ. And the parts of the body need one another. So this week, let's put into practice our neediness bef before one another. Reach out, put yourself in a, a position of dependence. Tell someone how they can encourage you and support you in this season. Let's not go solo. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, we thank you for the gift of your church, the body of Christ. And I pray this morning, that each one of us would know, even though we're scattered and separate, that we are connected to the body of Christ. And we thank you so much for Hope Community Church, how you have sustained this body over the years. And in this season, God, which is a lot different, help us to learn from you how we stay together as a body, how we depend on each other, how we demonstrate our need for one another. So God, we recognize we need your help with this. The circumstances are, are different than any of us have faced before. So we need your Holy Spirit to lead us and to strengthen our body during this time. So God, may we not live solo. May we not live independent, self-sufficient lives, but lead us now more than ever to depend on each other, to stay connected, and to live out what it means to be the body of Christ in this unique time. And so, God, we recognize uh, you are still leading us. You are still the head of the body. You are still 
in charge. Uh, so we look to you to lead us forward. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Morgan is going to lead us now in a song just to respond and, and to worship God. So the end of this, um, kind of like a worship medley, it kind of took a bunch of different choruses from some of my favorite songs and popped them together. One of the um, choruses just simply says, God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good to me. It goes like this. God, you're so good.
For God is good all the time. He is good. I want to read 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 for our benediction. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Church, we are God's chosen people. May we live it out this week, the joy and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. May God bless you and keep you. In his name, amen. Well, a few announcements.